Hi everybody and welcome to A Case of the Jills. My goal for today is to not sweat this whole time I'm filming. Today's video is inspired by an email I got asking me some questions about heart rate and how we can use measures of heart rate to understand a little bit more about our training and recovery. Now I could sit here and give you standard advice on what you're supposed to do with regard to training and heart rate. I could give you all that endurance athlete blah blah blah, but you know that's not really what we do on this channel. Oh, hi there. Instead, what I'm going to do is give you three ways to look at heart rate for people in our population. So if you're new here, welcome. I hope that you like this video and subscribe. But if you're watching this video, chances are you're having issues with either hypothalamic amenorrhea and or overtraining syndrome. You're probably training too much and not feeling properly. Therefore, the three things we're gonna talk about today with regard to heart rate are things that will help uncover practical information specific to our population. So in full disclosure, one of these ideas I really like, one of them kind of scares me, and the third one, I kind of hate. I know I love them too. Dog hair. Of course, whether or not I actually like the metric that we're gonna be talking about doesn't really matter. What does matter is that this information is quite revealing, and I think it's important, and I think you're gonna like it, so let's do it. Okay, let's do the good one first. Let's do the fun one. We're gonna talk about heart rate variability. Heart rate variability has to do with the time between each heartbeat. That's the easiest way I can put it. Turns out that those R wave pulses, you know, those big pulses that you see on an EKG, actually vary. It's not that you have the same amount of time between each heartbeat. You can either have very good heart rate variability, which means that there is a lot of variation between those different intervals, or you can have kind of bad heart rate variability, which is to say that those times between the beats are more fixed. Studies have shown that increased heart variability is linked to health and longevity, not just in sport, in life. And a decrease in heart rate variability has been linked to increasing amounts of stress and poor health. For athletes, it can be a sign that you're on the verge of burnout or that you need to take a rest day. Heart rate variability is so great because this measurement is actually a measurement of the overall physical and mental health, the amount of stress toll being taken on the body. Some interesting facts about heart rate variability, it can be altered by life stress things like travel, work-related stresses, too much alcohol, not enough sleep, poor nutrition. Heart rate variability in general goes down as we age. Heart rate variability is a little bit better when we're younger, as you would expect. Some other things to know is that if your heart rate variability has gone down, you might not even feel it. You might actually feel fine, but it does mean that there's some sort of lingering stress pulling on your resources. As I said before, a significant drop in heart rate variability means you need to take a rest day. If you ignore this and continue to train, you're gonna notice that that heart rate variability gets worse and worse. Increasing loads of training will decrease heart rate variability over time. It's important to know that anything that affects your nervous system is gonna show up in your heart rate variability. However, it's not important for you to be testing it all throughout the day. The best time to test it is actually early in the morning or during your hours of sleep. What I think is really cool about heart rate variability is that if you're paying attention to the numbers, you will find that it's not just training that depletes resources. And in the perfect world, if we're able to gain any information from the types of things that seem to stress us, we can hopefully use that to plan our lives better, plan our training better, and get that much needed recovery. So how do you measure heart rate variability? Honestly, the way to do it is with devices. There are a couple of different devices that are available on the market now. This video is absolutely not sponsored by any of them, so I'm not gonna mention anything by name, but there are some that will test your heart rate variability by testing your pulse, and again, testing the time between those heartbeats, and it's a little device that goes on your finger, that's why I'm going like this. And there's some other strap devices with proprietary technology, and you can find them online. By the way, they're based in Boston. Okay, now looking at my population of people who's gonna be watching this video, I have to tell you something really important about this. There are people that are gonna put that strap on their wrist, and they're gonna get a number in the morning that tells them that it's time for them to take a rest day, and they're not gonna do it. They're going to say, I physically feel fine, this device must be wrong or surely I can negotiate with these numbers. Come on, I know you. And I have to tell you that if that's the way you would approach uncovering very valuable information about your body and your capability on that given day, if that's the way you're gonna approach it, save your money. But if you feel like you would like the insight and are willing to actually do what it says, I think this is a really great way to understand what's happening in the total body system. Did I make my point? Okay, let's move on. So let's get to the second way of looking at heart rate. This is kind of like the old school stuff that I'm not really a big fan of. This is just a general measure of heart rate that you can get by using a chest strap and probably some kind of fancy watch that will tell you what your heart rate is doing. What I don't really like about this is that there's just a lot of like holes in the logic 
and there's a lot of loose ends to tie up. For athletes, what we wanna do is we wanna find our max heart rate. There's a couple of different ways to look at the formulas, but I really like the one that Stacy Sims used in the book Roar. She says to take the number 211 minus 64% of your age. Yes, that's a lot of math. In my case, it means my max heart rate would be 183. Yes, I said 183, I'm not ashamed. We would then take this max heart rate and then separate all the rest into five training zones. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the five zone heart rate system that lots of athletes have used since time immortal. You know, you have your zone one, which is sort of an easy effort. Zone two would be aerobic endurance. Zone three is a higher level of aerobic training, something that you might call like a tempo workout. Zone four is a lactate threshold or like a race pace. And zone five is your maximum effort. take your own personal measurement, but it's also really important that you self-monitor. Lots of this stuff is gonna be influenced by caffeine, hydration, rest, mood, and all kinds of other factors. If you are training with someone who's even your same age and you do the same type of training, your heart rate is gonna do different things. That's just a fact. But if you are monitoring your own heart rate and notice that you wake up one morning and it's 10 beats or more, higher than normal, you know that's time for you to take a rest day. And if you take nothing else out of this discussion of general heart rate monitoring, Here's the most important thing to know. If you have been redlining it lately and go out there and you're monitoring your heart rate and you're trying to work toward a maximal effort or a lactate threshold race pace kind of situation and you notice that your heart rate is not going up to where it needs to be, yeah, that's an indicator that you're heading toward training too much, overtraining, you need a day off. Your heart at that point is not supplying the necessary blood flow to your body and that's why you feel tired. So if you're noticing that heart rate is not going up where it usually does or where it needs to be, clear indicator that you are definitely in need of time off. As promised, there's one heart rate measure that can be a little bit scary, but it is really important that you understand. Brass tacks, kids. This one is a little bit scary because it tells us a lot about whether or not you are in danger with regard to your nutrition. Okay, I'm just gonna come out with it. You could be under fueling to the point where your body is starving, and taking this measurement that I'm gonna explain to you right now is a great way to understand if you are starving. I'm not gonna candy coat things. Come on, you know me by now. Here's why this is important. Lots of people in our community will go to a doctor and they will have bradycardia, which is very low heart rate, right? And the doctor will say, oh my gosh, your heart rate is so low, and what is our response? Oh doc, I'm an athlete, it's fine. I run so much, my heart rate is low because of that. And no one's gonna question you, right? Because we all know that athletes have low heart rates. But there's actually kind of a secret here. I would encourage you to check out the book called Sick Enough by Jennifer Gaudiani. She is a physician who is also an eating disorder specialist. And I researched her book while I was gathering literature for my thesis. In her book, she describes a lot of different indicators of starvation in the human body, but one of them is really applicable to our population. Dr. Gaudiani says that if your resting heart rate is under 50 beats per minute, it could be an indicator that your body is starving. She says that one of the ways to find out what's going on is to do something she calls the walk across the room test. So what you'll do is you'll sit or lay down for five to 10 minutes and take your heart rate. Then you'll get up, walk across the room and come back, stay standing, check your heart rate again. When the difference between the two numbers is 75% or more, your heart may not be an athlete's heart, it might be a starving one. Don't shoot the messenger, read the book, or look her up online and find out more about what she has to say about this. It can be incredibly enlightening and I encourage all of you to try it. Of course, as I said before, none of the data that you will collect on your heart rate or any other dang thing is gonna matter if you're not willing to do what's necessary to correct the problem. If you refuse to pay attention to the metrics, I ask you this, why are you refusing to pay attention? If you are continuing to train despite what you're learning about your body, what you're telling me is that you're not training for your sport, you're training for this. And if you watch this channel for any length of time, you know that that is a battle you will not win. And as you know, I've said before, yes, exercise is a great way to manage mental health, but there is a point of diminishing returns. There is a curve. There is a point after which you are going to incur more damage, physical and mental. And while I'm on my soapbox, I will repeat one of my favorite phrases. You are not weak to admit that you have limits. You are foolish to ignore that you have them. Some other points I wanna make clear about this. If you are already suffering from overtraining syndrome, none of what I just told you is going to help. The only thing that is gonna help is rest. 
Despite what you may have been told, you cannot train out of overtraining syndrome. What you can do is couch out of overtraining syndrome. I'd also like for you to keep in mind that recovery is not just about taking rest days, putting on our compression socks and laying on the couch. Recovery also encompasses a million and one practices, habits, attitudes, and ideas that we live with each and every day of our lives. A rest day is great, but if you're not feeling properly, it's not going to help. A rest day is wonderful, but if your life stress is super high, you never take time for self-care and you're not sleeping at night, again, it's not going to help. So hopefully some of the data that you've learned will help you understand the constellation of things that you need to do to create a good environment for overall recovery. If you are going to participate in endurance sports, with that comes a lot of responsibility. Is that overwhelming? Yeah, so is running 50 miles. Now, I know that some of these tools are gonna to be just a little bit too scary for some of the people watching this channel right now. I know that some of you will actively not pursue looking into these things because you're afraid of what the information forces you to do. If you're ready to have some accountability through data, I guess we can see we have options. Honestly, looking back, I wish that I had the opportunity to understand heart rate variability. I wish that I had that data, and I wonder if it would have prevented me from making some really bad choices. If anyone has personal experience using heart rate variability monitors to manage their training and recovery, I'd love for you to share it with me. Either send me an email at acaseofthegills.com or comment below if you like. Well, probably not your average heart rate training discussion, but I hope that you found it valuable today. So again, thanks so much for watching this video. Please do like and subscribe. You can schedule a mentoring call with me on acaseofthegills.com. The link is below. Hope you're having a great week wherever you are, and I will see you again soon.